about, they're going to get me the clicker. I think a Pocket ran off with it, maybe. So while we wait, oh, here it comes. Thanks. As you're about to discover for yourselves, uh, I'm not a very good public speaker. Uh, in fact, I think it's safe to say I'm bad at this. So, in fact, it was a little while ago, I was in my hotel room YouTubing all these videos of great stand-up comedians, trying to see if I could learn anything. And I noticed that 90% of them open their act with audience interaction. So how, how are you doing? How are you all doing? Okay. What, what could go wrong now? So, around 10 years ago, I was in a team starting launching a new product at Intel. And uh, long story short, our, our project did really, really well. And then one day, uh, some people came in and said, hey, look, you, you guys have done a great job with this project. Uh, this was about a few years into the project. But it's no longer strategic in the big picture, so there's no more budget. But well done, and good luck. Right? And we said, wait, go, go back to the part about our funding uh, not being there anymore. So knowing what it's like to, to think you're doing everything right, start a business, and, and then one day realizing something completely random can show up and uh, cause your business to fail, I, I naturally got kind of pissed off about it. So, the good news is that anger has catalyzed the next 12 years of my life, which, which I like to share <laughs> with what we do. So I started asking people around the company at the time, OK, this really sucks, right? Our project got killed. We, we had to lay off people. It was, it was a painful experience. And, and I felt like when we were trying to launch this product, I had gone to all these customers and made, you know, taken, made all these promises that, yes, we were going to deliver. Yes, we were going to be there. Yes, we were going to you know, do what we said and follow up on our promises and, and sort of based my personal honor and reputation on those promises. But then, one day, uh, I basically felt like I'd been made a liar of. I had to go back and tell all these people that, gosh, I'm actually powerless and, and, and it's, we're not going to be able to do all those things that we promised. So it's not just Intel, of course. It's every big company doing this dozens of times a year. They're always starting new projects and killing them, and very few make it, and most of them don't. And the same exists in startup world, right? We're out there putting our lives, uh, spending time on crappy hotel rooms and even crappier airplanes, trying to get something going. Um, and any time it could come and get, get capsized. So I wanted to know how often when companies like Intel launch a product or a startup gets launched, how often does that work out or fail? Because as somebody who is in the process of starting businesses, I, I just want to know what are the odds that I'm, I'm actually going to see a good outcome here. And what I realized at the time uh, is, is nobody really knew. It, for example, in Intel, nobody really knew how, what percentage of the time products succeeded or failed. And, it, and again, every company has the same problem. I challenge any company in the world to tell me the accuracy when they make a prediction on a new innovation. How often does that work out or not? And you'd be surprised that. So far, I've found nobody has any idea. So I thought this was insanity, right? Think of all the billions of dollars being spent on innovation every year. Think of all of us who are either investing in projects or starting projects or working in teams with projects. And nobody knows how often they make it or not. So we don't even know if we're getting better or worse year to year. Right? We, we go to amazing conferences. We go to TED Talks. We read books. We go to business school. But we still don't know if we're getting better or worse because we don't even know what the baseline is. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll just try to figure it out. So I started at the time hoarding all these pitch decks at Intel from venture capital investments, acquisitions, and product launches that the company had done, and started to put into a data set. And what I learned uh, was, was shocking. And I found, actually, a lot of the, the details about startups or new products or businesses that we obsessed over at Intel in our investment committees when we picked what to fund a lot of those clues that we liked just were not correlated with outcomes five, seven, or 10 years later. Whereas there were some other things that we certainly knew about, but we didn't think about too much, that were much more predictive of whether or not a new idea would make it or not. And so I realized, oh my god, what, what if this means we're looking at the wrong things? Which means if we change what we look at, we're not talking about a 5% increase in, in outcomes, but more like a 4 or 5x increase 
in the success rate of these products. So I thought this, this could be really exciting. But it was just, at the time, one company's data over one period of time, and we really needed to see, okay, does this even apply anywhere else? Or is it just an oddity of one company's history? So I partnered up with this professor at Harvard named Clayton Christensen, and Intel and Harvard sponsored a, a one-year R&D collaboration um, that Christensen and I led, where we basically went through and looked at lots of industries and lots of com companies across geographies to figure out what are the patterns that really do statistically predict success or failure when it comes to very early stage innovation, concept stage, or, or, or very early in their development cycle. So I'm going to show you what's grown out of that. I can't show you a lot of the, the super secret details, but the, the short story of that is um, when the year at Harvard was over, Christensen introduced me to Bill Hambrecht, who's one of the most successful venture capitalists of all time. And I ended up working at Hambrick Ventures, and I've been there 10 years, where what's happened is this computing system's evolved called MIS, which is such a terrible acronym, I'm not even going to tell you what it stands for. But it's, it's like our little Watson, basically. And we use very aggressive data modeling, data harvesting, and, and data science to figure out which deals we should invest in. And it's been extremely successful. Uh, the performance of these funds has just been astronomical. But I don't think it's because I'm particularly clever or, you know, Bill's amazing, but I, I actually think it's, I think our friends are doing well because we don't mind doing math, to be honest with you. Uh, and it's been my experience that most VCs don't like doing math. So, okay, we will, and we'll look good by comparison until they figure it out. So, let's just play venture capitalist for a second. Let's just pretend this startup is pitching us an idea. You're in Shark Tank, only you're the sharks. What do they call the others in Shark Tank? I don't know. Minnows? Shark? I don't know. Whatever. You're the sharks. And these nice people are pitching you their idea. And I'm just going to make this up. I'm just making it. Let's just uh, think of an app. Like, oh, OK, wait. So maybe there's an app they're pitching. And it's, it's a phone app where the, you know, there are certain apps that sort of tell you your mood through the day. And you can map how your mood changes. But this is an app that tells you your spouse or significant other's mood throughout the day. So you can look and see how they're doing. And if they're having a bad day, you might call them and seem like a super cool partner. So that's the app. They're pitching it to us. And, and they just have some PowerPoint and a prototype. So get excited. You're going to have to probably raise your hand. Who predicts, I'm going to say survive or fail, who thinks that probably survive? Two people. OK. Three. Who thinks that's probably doomed? Who refuses to participate in any event where they have to raise their hand? See, some of you didn't raise your hand right now because you don't participate, but I, I know you're out there. Okay. What do you have to base your decision on? Granted, almost nothing. You have an idea and a team. So what do you think venture capitalists say consistently is the number one thing they look for in a startup? Anyone? Teams, right? Most venture capitalists say, we why? Because that's all you kind of have to go with, right? I mean, that's visit the people. So it's like, OK, do I want to invest or not? Well, I mean, they, they seem nice. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the man bun, but whatever. Um, I don't know. Should I put in $2 million? Well, as much as we could form our opinion about this, then what happens if they leave and the next team shows up with the exact same idea? It, things just got more complicated. Now, who, who do we, now what? Even if we like the idea, well, which one do we fund? I mean, okay, well, this team over here seems a little bit more democratic, where, you know, here it's all about this guy with the man bun. I don't know, maybe you like teams versus strong leaders? I don't know, what's your favorite book, right? What, what makes you think one's going to do better than the other? And so this is a genuine problem that we have, right? What clues exist, the very early stages that are in any way predictive? And we can't just go about making up our feeling about which people and ideas we like. Because that could change depending on what we had for breakfast or whether or not this person had a haircut or whatever. So no wonder venture capital usually fails more than it succeeds. Same with new product launches at corporations. Same with startups. They called this the Inspire session. I don't think they had a depressing section because that would have been better fit for me. But um, on that note, 
Look, these decisions really matter. This question of how do you know whether a business will survive or fail, and what do you do about it, has extreme social consequence, right? It's not just about making money. It's about people's careers. It's about promises and being made a liar of. It, it's about the fate of entire communities who depend on businesses for their well-being. In 1960, Detroit was one of the best places on earth to live. In 2013, it declared bankruptcy. So what changed between 1960 and 2013 in Detroit? I would argue it wasn't that they had different kinds of hard-working people. It wasn't the politicians were more enlightened or less enlightened. It wasn't the presence or absence of nonprofits. It wasn't more or less doctors or lawyers or accountants. It's just that three companies failed. Just, just three. Three companies failed. And that's all it took to transform Detroit from one of the best cities in the world to one that's struggling and bankrupt. That's the impact that our decision-making has as business people, everybody in this room. So if we really believe that, then why aren't we studying business decision-making in a much more quantitative and aggressive fashion? And, and that's what I'm going to try to convince you of over the time that we have today. That this is not only something that's possible, but it's something that we have to take seriously and something we all need to start to do. Here's an interesting case study. So this is one of the, um, it's been sanitized, but it's one of the most innovative companies. If, if you were all to list your 10 most amazing, innovative companies, it would probably be on all of your lists, right? This is a company that seems like everything that happens that they touch is fairy dust, and everything they go, you know, everything they invest in blooms and is fabulous. But when I met them, they, they describe their innovation incubation pipeline, right? So they have a special group for innovating new projects. And some of you, this will be familiar. They get about, you know, from all their proposals, they have an investment committee that qualified around 36% of them, you know, sort of which are the better, which are worse. 26% of those got a little bit of attention to go deeper. The best of those 8% would do MVP and lean startup and iterate fast, and they'd have dedicated resources and a team, and they did some really interesting exploration. And then the whole goal was to get what they call launch money, which is 4% of the total, which is up to 20 million a year, up to 70 people. Like now, it's really go and commercialization time. So when I met this company, they were very proud, and they spoke at a conference kind of like this and showed their pipeline. And I went up afterwards, and I said, well, that's great, but out of that 4%, like, what, what happened? Like, what, what happens next? And they, they said, well, well, I don't know. Uh, so we, we decided to get to the bottom of it, and we found that 40% of that 4%, so 40% of the successes were shut down later. Okay, that, that happens, right? But 36% of them graduated out of the incubator, back into the corporate parent company, and then were shut down. So the, the incubator had thought those were wins, but it turns out, they got out of the nest and then flew in the sky and got eaten by a, you know, a, a bird of prey of some kind, right? And then 8% were spun out just as a fire sale. It was never very profitable. And then only 16% of them hit the goal, which is to graduate out of incubation and not die. And when we looked at that 16%, they were all supposed to be these big disruptive innovations. Um, all, six, all of the 16% were just these little incremental feature improvements over the existing products the company had already made for a decade. So this incubation group got shut down after over 10 years of operation. And these are some of the smartest, nicest people, most innovative, creative people you've ever met. And so when you think of the success rate based on what this group's goals were, it was 16% of 4%, which is around half a percent. So that's not good, right? When you have the smartest people doing their best. Why has history shown us there's such a sound barrier to break through and such a high failure rate? And this is the dream, isn't it? This is why this conference is here. This is why we're all here. It's because if resources find the right opportunities, those opportunities grow, which creates more value that comes back to the investor, and then they can invest in more startups that do even better, and it's this wonderful creative cycle. But what we're finding happens just as often, or perhaps a lot more often, is it's a destructive cycle, where resources are allocated with good intentions, the best intentions, to opportunities that don't do well. 
and they don't perform well, which means the funds or allocators get less money to invest, which means even fewer projects get invested in and more jobs are destroyed than created and everything gets sucked down. So this is the reality we face as innovators today, and it's been the same as far as I know since Thomas Edison, right? So for around 100 years, this is what we're signing up for in the world of innovation. So which makes me ask this question, which was the theme of the talk. We've all heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect probably, but is it possible in all humility that, that we're just not very good at this, but we have no idea how bad we are? I mean, if 70, 80, 90 percent of innovations fail, regardless of whether you're a startup, regardless of whether you're a venture capitalist, regardless of whether you're a corporation or an SME, that's a pretty high failure rate. And it's in the, you know, we tend to be the most confident when we're the least aware of our shortcomings. So is it possible that despite all the books and talks and everything that we've done since Thomas Edison, we're just not very good at this, and we're, we think we're good at it, but we're not? And I think the data suggests this might be more true than we would like to believe. So what do we do? So I'm going to show you our attempt to address this issue. I'm not going to claim that we've figured it out because we haven't, and I want to show you where we're stuck and where we're struggling and where we're trying to improve, as well as what we've accomplished, because that's just good science, right? It's not about saying we have a crystal ball, but I just want to hopefully show you today that some progress is being made on this very important question. And I want to try to encourage all of you to start thinking this way, even if you're not a data scientist or a math person. <laughs> Here's a real startup, Apnex Medical. They make a solution. Uh, it goes in your body like a pacemaker, and it stops you from snoring. So obstructive sleep apnea is a, is a big problem throughout your life as your body's being deprived of oxygen when you're supposed to be sleeping and regenerating. It creates lots of comorbidities like hypertension, um, diabetes, and, and other things. So by curing it, now, the idea was this pacemaker could go in your body, and you could imagine over time it just gets smaller and smaller until someday it's just a chip under your jaw and you don't snore. But at this stage, we're looking at a device. The, the former president of Boston Scientific Cardiology was the founder, so an amazing team. They'd raised 50 million bucks from some of the smartest healthcare venture capital firms, investors uh, in the States. So very smart money, people who know med device were in this deal, and they were trying to raise another 10 million bucks to get through their very last clinical trial. Okay, so just a random example. So what do we do? Do we just take the pitch and decide whether we like the man bun or not? Like, what, what do we do? How do we decide whether to put 10 million in this company? Well, I'll show you how our fund is doing it. Not that we're the best and the most amazing, but just as an example of how data can totally change the way you think about this business. We have three-step process at our fund. First, we have this vast digital surveillance infrastructure that's very expensive and very aggressive, and we're pulling data off the web that we find valuable that tells us who's winning and losing in any market at any time. So we can see how much traction startups or new products are getting with their customers or losing, which lets us look at entire industries. So instead of seeing, normally to see 1,000 startups, it would take 1,000 one-on-one meetings, which takes a year. We could look at a thousand startups in a day or uh, let's say a week, see who's winning and just go talk to them. So that's a very different way to approach a market. We haven't had a single meeting, but we already know the top four or five startups in a space. We'll go to them. We do a much deeper actuarial analysis using computing power. I'll show you what that looks like, which tells us specifically of those top candidates, what are the specific odds that each will hit our goals as investors or not? So is it a 10% chance? 50%, 70%, like what are the odds of each deal? And if the odds are high enough, we just do regular due diligence like every other fund at that point. So the humans show up. So if steps one or two say no, we will not invest. That's it, we can't veto that decision. But if the algorithms say yes on steps one and two, then the humans come in and only the humans can decide at the end which deals get done as long as they've been blessed by the algorithms at every stage. So it's a hybrid. We still look at teams. We still care about the qualitative stuff, but we don't waste our time with that touchy-feely stuff until the deals are already winning and have the odds we want. So we're beating most venture capital funds in performance right now because we're cheating, right? <laughs> we're not guessing on which to fund. We're actually seeing who's already winning and investing in them. 
And here's the first step, how we do that. This is a technology conference, so somebody said, okay, fine, I can put a slide like this. Uh, there were three technical challenges we had to solve that, again, have taken about a decade, and, and each one had an incredible amount of cost and, and burden associated with it. But first, we need to identify who is a target population that's an affinity group in a specific space, like sleep apnea. We'll use that example. So buyers and sellers, doctors and patients in the sleep apnea community. Second, we have to figure out what are all the possible solutions they could use to treat sleep apnea, which is harder than it looks. And third, we have to be able to map which of the population, which of the solutions the population is showing more or less interest in based on behavioral indicators that we can glean in a digital space. So literally, who are the, who's the market, what are the products, and which ones are winning or losing based on traction in the population? And we can do that, and it ends up looking like a chart. So here's what the chart looks like. I've sanitized it a bit and just put A, B, C, D because I just figured, hey, if the companies are in the audience, I don't want to make anybody look bad. <laughs> um, but Apnex Medical, you can see, was right here. So that bar that you see is showing how much traction our indicators show each product is getting in the market. And you might notice that the zero bar, Apnex Medical, is a little bar and it's negative, which means it's actually small but losing traction in the market even though it hasn't even launched its first product yet. So right away that tells me, if I'm going to invest in sleep apnea, it's not going to be an Apnex Medical, because they're, not, they're already losing traction, and they haven't even launched yet. However, now I'm super curious about who V, W, and X are over here, because I never heard of them before, but look at them, they're winning, they're growing like crazy. If I'm going to invest in a startup, it's going to be one of those, and nobody else. Uh, because they have much worse probabilities of actually being the market leader. So we're cheating. We get to the end of it first. We see who is winning that could be very early and very small, and that's where we put our money. Here's an example of that. Oh, by the way, Apnex Medical, they did raise that extra $10 million, and about a year later, the company failed, and the investors lost all $60 million. Uh, but we dodged that bullet because we could see that that just probably wasn't the best deal for us. And you can see it, too just by looking at one chart. Here's a deal we did in a company called Arkimoto. It's a three-wheeled EV a company in Eugene, Oregon, this little tiny company. And when we looked at electrical vehicles back at the time, we found you know, there were a bunch of huge companies like Tesla and Volkswagen in the space. And then there was this little company called Arkimoto. And we're like, who, who the hell are they? Right? This, and we thought, all right. So we, we did our other steps and our due diligence, and we ended up investing. Um, they had a $9 million valuation in, when we did the deal, uh, the, or March of 2015, and then two and a half years later, it had a small IPO on the NASDAQ at a $99 million. So 10x in two and a half years is, is a nice increase. Um, but you can see, we couldn't get any other venture capitalists other than us to invest in Arkimoto. Because they all said, oh, wait a minute, it sounds like an electric car, aren't those expensive, don't they take forever? Forget it, you know, we want a, hard, we want a startup app, we don't want you know, hardware, blah, blah, blah. And we said, OK, but we'll still invest because the numbers look right. And we don't care if anybody's going to follow us. Um, and so often the most rewarding finds are the most counterintuitive. It's being willing to take the deal that nobody else will take if it's the right deal. So that's a quick look at something that's being done and that we've been doing for a decade now. So this is not new. We also find that Silicon Valley's share of the best deals is shrinking all the time. And this is interesting for the group in the audience today. So when, here's just an example of one industry. We looked at a bunch of health tech companies. But whatever industry we run in a pie chart, you'll notice that Silicon Valley has you know, about a quarter of the, the top deals that we found. But all the rest of the deals are spread all over the world in cities, 3%, 3%, all these little tiny deals. So the best deals used to be very concentrated in Silicon Valley and Boston, but that becomes less true every day. We're finding the best deals are showing up like scattered dust all over the world. We found an amazing startup the other day in Bandung, Indonesia. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to Bandung, but like, it is, does not jump out as a startup mecca. But this was a great deal, and we looked at it. Um, and we never would have seen it if we weren't using data science to show which companies are winning and bringing them to us to consider. You can't put, as a venture capitalist or a corporation, you can't put an analyst in every city on Earth in the hopes that some might someday find a cool deal, 
right? Tr labor intensive venture capital, which is how it's always been done. We don't think of it as labor intensive, but that's it. It's people and man hours trying to pick deals. That model does not work in a world where the deals are being scattered all over the planet. You need technology or something else. Otherwise, you're only going to see a tiny sliver of what's out there, and you can't just pick the best deals wherever they are at any time. The second step we do, I cannot get into a ton of detail because I won't have the time, and those of you who are still awake would fall asleep if I started going into this. But we essentially, after we know a company's winning, we do that analysis. We can see the probabilities it'll win or lose. We, we, it's kind of like a weather simulation in a way, right? It's a very complex, compute-intensive, algorithmic simulation where we can look at a company and all its competitors and its target customers and we say what are the odds that this company will win competing against all these other rivals for those customers and if the odds are high enough we'll do the deal if they're not high enough we won't if you want to know how accurate that step is which I think at the end of the day is what you want to know uh, by the way here's the accuracy this may be the first and the last time a venture capitalist ever do their accuracy. So um, when our system, MIS, our computing system, and this is thousands of predictions it's made for over a decade, where it's made predictions and then waited years to find out what happened and tracked the accuracy. So this is not a back test. These are live predictions. When it's predicted the business would survive, it's been right around two out of three, 67%. And it's been very constant in this event. So that's pretty good, but it's still wrong a third of the time, which is why we have to do other forms of diligence too. Um, but it's right two out of three, which is much better than those 70, 80, 90% failure rates we talked about a couple minutes ago. Obviously, if it predicts the business will fail, it looks super accurate at 86%. But that's just because around 85% of businesses happen to fail. So, so if all you do is predict failure, all the time, if you're just a pessimist, you're going to look about 85% accurate. So it's kind of an illusion. It, it makes the system look better than it really is. So I tend to say, no, no, don't be fooled by a data set anomaly. Two out of three, 67, 66%. That's what I feel confident our system has performed at. Uh, the rest is just artificially makes it look too good. Now, what about that 33 and 14% where we're wrong? Because I promised you I would say what we're struggling with because algorithms aren't the end-all, be-all of everything. There's three areas that this particular tool uh, has blind spots in. One is what we call technical risk, which is will the product fundamentally work? So sometimes our system will think a business will be great, but then the engineers and the start, they just never get the product to work. And our system can't predict that. And that's an issue, right? So we have to do other forms of diligence. Second. User experience risk. Will people buy the product? Like, will humans find a product delightful? Our system is not a human. It does not know that. So it's a blind spot. Third is regulatory risk. Will the drug pass the FDA? Or will the FinTech get through the SEC and FINRA? Right? Regulatory and political issues, our, our system is just not tuned for those as well. So we're, we're trying to improve those blind spots. But we're finding that's where the error is. So there's always things we can't predict. And we have to compensate by trying to look at those things as humans, the old school way, qualitatively, because we don't have a better way to do it. But if we could automate those things, we would do it tomorrow. And that's just the attitude we have at our firm. And by the way, there's less than one chance in 10,000 we've been lucky all this time. So statistical confidence is very high. Um, so here's my favorite picture of somebody who doesn't seem to understand probability theory. And I do feel like most of us have been playing the innovation game like the gambler, right? We're, we're sitting there, even Thomas Edison wrote extensively about this, right? You know, you're doing all this stuff and you're just hoping something will hit. It's like, oh, please God, may one of these deals actually pay for everything, right? You know, you're, you're plugging away at innovations and you're hoping you'll just hit a big enough win that it'll make everything okay. And, and that's you know, we can dress it up as educated and intelligent and, you know, and business school talk, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a guess. And in this transaction, over time, there's one consistent winner when it comes to making money. And it's not the gambler, it's the casino. So what's the difference? Well, the gambler is hoping to beat the odds and maybe unaware of the odds 
or the data and is just hoping maybe they will get lucky. But the casino knows the odds of every single machine on every single play in that entire casino, and they have gamed and structured that entire place so that they have the statistical advantage and the money flows in their direction every single time. And that's what we've been able to do in our portfolio, understanding what the odds are, where your error is, and staging a portfolio such that you hit your goals, even accounting for the fact that there's risk and things will fail, but being able to specify how many of things are going to fail and what percentage is a very different way of running a portfolio than spray and pray. And, and that's, that's what I want to get across. So if you're a startup, how can you start thinking like a casino? instead of a gambler. If you're a corporate, same thing. If you're a venture capitalist, definitely the same thing. Because as long as you're playing the gambler, you know that even if this nice lady hits the jackpot once, if the casino can buy her enough free drinks and a hotel room and the buffet, and she just stays long enough, the money will go back to the house. And there's, there's a reason that that happens. So, we're here towards the end. I've already said, okay, when we don't do this right as decision makers, it can go very, very badly, not just for us, but for the communities that are depending on us to create value. But if we do it right, we can have a huge impact. Once upon a time, Nepal and South Korea's GDPs per capita were not that far apart. But look now, 50 years later, we have Nepal, which is still struggling, and I lived there for five years, so I know this, you know, this is something I care about. But South Korea, in the same period of time, has become South Korea. Why? Because they had a few companies that really broke through and lifted up the entire society around them. So just as much as bad decisions can tear down a community, the right decisions can build it up. And even if we don't like math, even if it's no fun to do actuarial science, we have to as society. Because what we've been doing since Thomas Edison hasn't been working well enough. And it's time for that to change, whether we like it or not. So I'm at the end of my talk. I just want you to remember three things. And today was about sharing and hopefully just trying to push against some of your thinking and say, hey, can we do better? Because I think we can. Knowledge is still power. And why are we doing this? Because it really does matter. Because it's not just about making money, which we all want to do. It's not just about having a great success that we can talk about. It's, it's about creating jobs and well-being for communities. And they're hoping that those of us in this room are going to be able to do that so that everybody else can come up with us. So thank you for your time. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting the, uh, the cane or if you wanted to do Q&A. But thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Thomas Thurston.